Welcome everyone, uh, my name is Adam Weezer, and I will be your host this week for another installment of Loremaker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, for those unfamiliar, this is a show where a member of the lore team sits down and walks through, you through a specific star system, tells you a bit of the history, some of the stories that uh, have occurred there, some of the science and other little tidbits about it. Uh, so you can kind of get educated on the, the entire galaxy that you'll be exploring in the PU uh, and enjoying in Squadron 42. So um, this week we're going to go to an um, extremely important uh, system for many reasons, uh, a lot of them being historical and some just on its, uh, its mere placement. Um, it is one of only two systems that is directly connected to the Sol system. So um, as we look here on the map where we're starting, we're on, uh, we're on Earth. And it's one of the systems we can just even uh, pitch up here a little bit. And there you see uh, the jump point that'll lead us to it. So today we are gonna go and visit the Davian system. All right, so we're gonna back out here. And as you can see, um, besides Croshaw, Davian is one of only two systems that is directly connected to Sol. Uh, because of this, the Davian system is notoriously uh, has notoriously difficult uh, um, custom standards. Just because not only is it one of the gateways to uh, humanity's homeworld, it also lays on a very important and strategic uh, trade route that connects Sol and Terra. Um, so Sol and Terra, I believe, is like a like a five uh, a five jump journey, uh, which has to go through uh, which goes through the Davian system as kind of one of the quickest ways to get there. So let's uh, zoom on in and take a, a bit of a closer look of this system. It's a um, four-planet system uh, with a K-type uh, main sequence star at the center. Now, uh, K-type main sequence stars are kind of like a yellowish orangish in, uh, in color, uh, and they normally have a, an average surface temperature around 5,316 degrees Kelvin. Uh, just for a point of reference, uh, the sun at the heart of our system sits at 5,778 degrees Kelvin on average. So it's just a little bit cooler than what you would see uh, in the Sol system. Now, uh, Davian was first discovered in 2430 by Wendell Dopsy, who very smartly named the system after his father-in-law. Um, it's, uh, as I said, it's got a, it's got a four-planet system, and I think the best way to actually uh, break it down and, and kind of like explore it is to actually work it backwards. So uh, we are going to start out here at uh, the Davian 4. Uh, let's zoom right on in. And Davian 4 is an ice giant that is renowned for having a, a very picturesque and beautiful atmosphere. Yet the, the most interesting thing about Davian 4 is actually what is in orbit around it, and that is the Banu Friendship Museum. Now, um, this is important, and even though the museum is, is hardly ever visited and seems to perennially be on the chopping block when it comes to government funding, it's still there and it's uh, still a very important part of UE history because it was in the outer reaches of the Davian system that humanity made contact with the, the first aliens in, uh, in their history. Uh, it was out here in 2438 that Vernon Tarr, a, an explorer, was searching the outer reaches for potential jump points. Uh, while doing this, he spotted a, a strange ship kind of following him, and just out of instinct, figuring that this was somebody trying to jump one of his potential claims, he shot at that ship. Uh, luckily for all parties involved, he missed. And the, the pilot of that ship was a Banu, who humanity would come to know and love and call Jerry, uh, who was piloting, piloting a Banu merchantman. Uh, needless to say, uh, Jerry was just as surprised as Wendell was that uh, there was a new race out there. And uh, it turned into a, 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 a meeting even though it started with a shot fired across the bow. Um, after um, the authorities were contacted, the UNE sent out uh, a General Neil Sokolovich to come and deal directly with Jerry and then the uh, Banu delegation that was dispatched to the system shortly thereafter. Uh, once humanity and the Banu were able to figure out how to communicate 
communicate together. Um, it didn't take long. I think I think it was maybe a month or two before the first uh, interstellar peace and trade accord was signed between humanity and the Banu. Um, when this happened, this generated a lot of buzz within the UNE at the time, not only because there was obviously our first alien friends in the world, um, but also there was a lot of potential for trade. The Banu um, are, are uh, huge traders, so uh, people, tried, uh, uh, people and corporations flooded to the Davian system in the hopes of doing deals with uh, a whole new market. Um, what was interesting, though, is that, and humanity did not discover this until years later as we, we back on out, is that Davian is actually nowhere near the Banu front. As you can see here, here's Davian, which is essentially probably we would consider it a core human world. But the uh, the Banu world, you can see I'm, I'm backing out here, and we're not even we're not even getting into the picture. We've got Geden, we've got Bacchus here, um, so it's still a a good deal away from Davian space. Uh, it turns out that Jerry, the pilot of the Banu merchantman, was also a fugitive from a few Banu guilds and had some people after him he did not want to have to deal with. It was because of this that he found himself so far away from Banu space. So even though a lot of people and a lot of corporations flooded the system in the hopes of making new alien friends, uh, it was never quite to be because Davian actually, in the grand scheme of things, uh, didn't turn out to be on the edge of the, uh, of the Banu world. So let's go back in um, and let's uh, move on closer to Davian 3. Now this planet is a terrestrial smog planet with a very dangerous uh, atmosphere filled with acid. Um, so it's one of those you don't want to get too close and humanity never really considered doing much with it because the acid is supposedly so strong that it can melt ship hulls. So while you may want to avoid it, um, there are often reports that crime syndicates in the Davian system use this planet to, let's say, dispose of objects, ships, people that maybe they don't want to be found. So if you do pass the system, be careful not only for its uh, uh, acidic atmosphere, but also for uh, the type of people that do spend a lot of time around it. Now, moving on to Davian 2. This is really the, the heart and the soul of the Davian system. Uh, it's named Cestulus, and uh, the main city that uh, you'll be able to, to visit there is called Jada. Now, uh, Cestulus is, uh, was recognized in the early uh, 25th century. Um, and has been an important part of the, the empire ever since then. Um, as I mentioned previously, when the Banu were first discovered, lots of corporations flooded to the system in hopes that uh, um, this would be a great place to, to spend time and to meet uh, the new alien race. Uh, one of those companies which you are all probably very uh, familiar with is uh, Aegis Dynamics, the, uh, the ship company. Now, Aegis was originally a, a merger between two companies, which is Aegis Macro Computing, which was Earth uh, an Earth-based uh, company, and uh, Dynamics uh, Productions, which was actually based out here in Davian. And when they when they merged, they uh, they came together and they put their um, their center of op operation right here to be able to access the wider world. So when you visit Jada, you'll be able to go to the Aegis showroom and see see the show floors and see a variety of their ships. Now, uh, Aegis famously be, were, were the favorite ships of Ivar Messer, the, uh, the despot that ruled the, uh, the UEE for, uh, or the fa whose family ruled the UEE for, for centuries. Um, and because of this, they were, they were popular uh, with the military for a handful of centuries, but once the Messers were deposed, they quickly fell out of public favor and were almost seen as a symbol of that era. Um, in the subsequent decades and centuries after the Messers uh, went, went aside, a lot of these uh, military ships that Aegis had built uh, trickled down to the second had market and became extremely popular in certain civilian circles. Um, because of this popularity and because of the ship's performance and the stuff that they could do, Aegis has recently uh, experienced a, an uptick and kind of a resurgence in popularity now that they've put enough distance between themselves and the the Messer era. Um, so yeah, going back to the uh, early 26th uh, century when this uh, planet became uh, first recognized, and when we say recognized in lore, that means that uh, the planet gets an official name and it also gets uh, voting rights in the Senate 
um, in the government senate. And it didn't take long for uh, Cessulus's political uh, might to kind of come to bear. Uh, in 2525, um, their senator, Nomi Rao, stepped onto the floor and presented something that would become known as the Common Laws. Now, at the time, the UPE was struggling with how to govern an ever-expanding empire, um, where there was a diversity of opinions and government styles and, and lots of different factors. What uh, the Common Laws proposed was a baseline of rights that any planet that wanted to join the, the wider government and become a, a voting member of the, of, uh, of the Senate would need to follow to basically achieve those, uh, uh, you know, achieve that status. Uh, after a year of very vigorous debate, uh, the common laws were passed. Uh, this allowed um, those planets and systems and local governments to basically govern themselves in whatever way they saw fit or was best suited for their planet as long as they adhered to these common standards. Uh, the common laws are a very port, an important piece of legislation and are considered one of the cornerstones of the government to this day. A few years after that happened, um, another uh, incident occurred on Jeddah, uh, in the city of Jeddah, that would be politically important also. After unifying um, under the common laws, the UPE decided it was time to unify the currency too, and thus the UEC was created. Now, not everyone was extremely happy with the fact that uh, there was going to be one unified currency, currency and some even predict, predicted that there, it could lead to economic collapse. Um, the most vocal opposition actually occurred in writing that uh, on Jada uh, during 2529. Uh, now, this became known as the Siege of Jeddah, lasted two weeks, and actually required the UPE to deploy the military into the system to actually stop the riots. Um, hundreds were injured, even two police were killed, and uh, uh, the UPE military got a lot of flack for it taking so long. Now, one of the interesting reasons why the riots were able to last so long is that uh, Jeddah, unlike, me unlike many other places on the planet of Cestulus, are actually covered by biodomes. Now, these biodomes are have become the iconic symbol when you'll see when you fly down over the city or when you look up into the sky when you're visiting Jeddah. And these biodomes are essential because when the UNE um, basically got bids to have companies terraform this planet, this being the only habitable planet in the Davian system, they awarded the bid to uh, Geo, uh, Babco Geobuilders, who were a, a, a kind of young terraform company that won it, won the bid not because of their sterling reputation, but just because they brought in the lowest bid. Now, at the time that Geo Babco, uh, the Geo Builders uh, built the uh, uh, terraform the planet, uh, not everything went quite right, and it resulted in a very thin atmosphere. It's still breathable to humans, but it's, let's say, more equivalent to trying to live on the top of the Himalayas or the Andes or the Alps. It's, uh, it's something you could deal with, but is not ideal. So giant biodomes were built over many areas of the planet as a way to be able to more easily pump oxygen into the, uh, into the areas that humanity was taking over. Again, uh, this happened uh, right on the heels of uh, people trying to come into the system and check out the band new and all that stuff. So the idea of having to spend money to re-terraform the planet just doesn't make sense and the biodomes was the solution. Now how this factors in to the siege of Jeddah is that part of the reason why these riots lasted so long is that protesters had taken control over a series of the air purification units in the city of Jeddah and the UPE military was concerned that these units could be turned off um, and possibly not give help pump enough oxygen into the area or even worse that uh, other chemicals or things could be pumped into the system through these units. Uh, so that was their justification for why the siege of Jeddah lasted for, uh, for, for two whole weeks. Moving on to 2545, another extremely important historical event occurred here on Jeddah and involved the biodomes. At, uh, at noon on December 15th of 20, uh, 2545, 
a series of strategically placed uh, bombs exploded and actually crumbled the biodomes of Jeddah down onto the population below, killing hundreds. This was a travesty and it was shocking to the entire empire. Uh, it was also the first of six uh, bombing campaigns, bombing attacks, that terrorized the UPE over the course of the next few months. Um, even though nothing was uh, proven at the time, there were strong implications based on the materials used in the bomb that uh, Shion terrorists uh, were the ones responsible for it, uh, which fed into the burgeoning Cold War between humanity and the Shion. Uh, at the time, the high general of, uh, of the UPE government was one Ivar Messer, and he proposed something called the Prime Citizen. Now what this was, it was a referendum that citizens voted on and eventually would pass, which would consolidate power of the government under one position, a prime citizen, also to become known as imperator. Uh, prior to that, the UPE was uh, governed by a triumvirate, which included the high general, which at the time was Ivar Messer, a high secretary, and a high advocate. Um, Messer argued that the triumvir uh, triumvirate was, as a, a political system, a political way of governance, was weak, it was ineffectual, it, um, it was slow to respond to emergencies, all points which seemed to be emphasized by the UPE's inability to track down who was uh, um, causing these terrorist bombings all around the empire. Of course, after the uh, prime citizen initiative passed, uh, Ivar Messer did ascend to the role of Imperator, and his family would then go on to uh, uh, tyrannical rule over the, over the, the coming centuries. Um, it wasn't until 2806 that uh, the, uh, a Truth and Reconciliation Committee was finally put together to come to terms with the atrocities that happened during the Messer era. Uh, this was after the, the Messer family had been officially deposed. And uh, one of the people who spent time digging through the archives of all the information that was released in the Truth and uh, Reconciliation Committee was uh, a researcher uh, and a um, uh, uh, a scholar, a uh, rudder-based scholar by the name of Sidney Carmark, who was always obsessed with the, the bombing campaigns that had basically led to the prime citizen uh, plan being adopted. Now, as she started to dig through details, she uncovered some new information which had never been seen before, which she published in a book called The Path to, prime Citizen, uh, Path to the Prime Citizen, which became a bestseller and basically implicated Ivar Messer as the orchestrator of these terrorist bombing campaigns. Now, Sidney Carmack was able to pull this thread to, through based on evidence she found coming back here to Jeddah. So in the days prior to the, bio, the explosion that collapsed the biodomes, a man by the name of Cyrus Ishitaka was arrested in a slam sting in Jeddah. Uh, later that night, he was very quickly and very quietly released from jail with, uh, without much reason except for uh, one name which could be tied back to an atom core. Now, Sidney Carmack, as a researcher, recognized these names because Cyrus Ishitaka and Adam Kaur were both, um, were both soldiers that fought alongside Ivar Messer during the bad Battle of Idris IV. Uh, Adam Kaur was an infiltration expert, and uh, Cyrus Ishitaka was a demolition expert. Uh, she was able to follow the connection through even more thoroughly by noting that Cyrus Ishitaka could be tracked to five out of the six planets in the days prior to the terrorist uh, attacks that occurred there. Um, Cyrus Ishitaka's fate actually is a, is a pretty sad one. He was discovered shot dead in a New York City alley uh, days after the final bombing did occur. Um, reports of this, uh, the, the, of the autopsy around his death were sealed. It was, it was wiped under the rug as a slam deal gone wrong. But the Truth and Reconciliation Co um, Council basically released this, uh, uh, this detail too. And it was found that Cyrus Ishitaka actually had trace amounts of Xi'an explosive under his fingernails in the autopsy. Uh, Adam Kaur, the other member, um, was a complete ghost during this time, um, during the terrorist campaigns. Um, but he did very fortuitously um, 
suddenly surface after Ivar Messer became elected prime citizen uh, because Ivar Messer then appointed Adam Kor a prominent role in the uh, UEE military. Now again, um, while none of this can be definitively proven, it is considered by many and is almost prob you know public uh, belief at this point that Ivar Messer did orchestrate these bombing campaigns to ascend to the prime citizen. Now, another fun little thing about uh, the, the planet of Cestulus here, um, besides Aegis Dynamics uh, having its uh, main headquarters here, uh, it can also uh, be considered the birthplace uh, in a strange way to uh, Apocalypse Arms, the ship's weapon manufacturing company uh, that you should uh, be f uh, familiar with already um, and can, can fire their guns and Arena Commander in some of the games right now. Uh, so in 2792, um, Dalton Calabello, who was a, a construction magnate and a collector of uh, uh, antique uh, military replicas, bought this strange crate at a, uh, an auction at a Davian warehouse. Uh, when he got home, he opened the crate, and inside he found two prototypes of weapons that he had never seen before. Now, Calabello just became obsessed with figuring out the history of these weapons and spent the next few years of his life consulting experts and trying to track down exactly where they came from. So it uh, turns out that uh, these weapons were built by a former Aegis uh, engineer by the name of Juliet Malpin. Uh, she was put in contact with uh, Linton Messer XI, who was the last Messer to rule the UEE. Now, Messer, uh, Linton Messer understood at that time that the walls were closing in on their dictatorship, and he was growing concerned that uh, there might be a rebellion against him. As his way to kind of ensure against that, he decided he needed a new uh, line of extremely powerful ship weapons built to defend himself in case of this occurrence. Uh, through some back channels, uh, engineer Juliet Malpin was put in contact with him and went off to design these weapons. Now she understood that working with the Messer government in such a politically sensitive time could be problematic, and because of that, she snuck away and did her work in secret using a variety of shell companies to hide what she was doing. When she finished her prototype, she put him in this case and sent him off to Messer. And while they were in transit, the massacre of Garen occurred, which was was the, basically the tipping point which um, basically deposed uh, Linton Messer um, and the entire Messer family from control of the UEE. That crate with those two prototypes was then stuck in this Davian warehouse and sat there for decades until Dalton Calabello finally picked it up and bought it. Now, Calabello was able to track Malpin, who, um, after the fall of the Messers, uh, fled uh, to the coral system where she worked there and uh, still had relatives and was able even uh, to even track down some of her old notes and uh, diagrams and plans for these weapons. He has since used those to basically start Apocalypse Arms and sell these weapons to the public, um, even bragging that these were uh, weapons intended for the Messers, but uh, that the Messers never got to use. To him, this is a success story. The Messers created these extremely powerful um, weapons, but were never able to use them, but now you can. So that's how he's kind of uh, spun his sales pitch on the history behind uh, behind these weapons. Um, finally, just one other personal note I want to add here. I know I've been talking about Cestulus a lot, but uh, Cestulus here is, and Jetta in particular, is the home to Elroy Cass. Now, any of you who read the lore know that Elroy Cass is a frequent uh, guest in the Star Watch uh, post, which tracks the, the star and celebrity culture of uh, 2946 UEE. And Elroy Cass, let's say, is the misfit extraordinaire of, uh, of the era so far. I like to personally think of him as the Keith Richards of, uh, of our universe, the, the one who can out-party and outlast and somehow outlive everyone, despite doing some of the, the most uh, uh, hardcore things out there. So I uh, just wanted to tip my cap very, very slightly to uh, Jetta being the home of Elroy Cass, the infamous Davian Deviant.
Uh, and one more planet here in the system for you to check out. This is Davian 1, which is a rocky terrestrial world, has no minerals on it, it has no core. It's uh, probably best compared to our moon. Um, but yeah, just a, another little rock uh, circling close here to Davian's K-type star. So um, that concludes uh, this week's episode of Lore Maker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm Adam Weezer. This has been the Davian System, and uh, I'll see you around the verse.